Welcome everyone to today's webinar hosted by ECIS. It's so great to see so many of you here. I think we had about 39 countries, hopefully in attendance today, which is incredible. Um, and it's so great that so many of you have been able to join. Uh, my name is Jo Whitson and I am Head of Events here at ECIS and it is my pleasure to in introduce today's webinar. Um, we'll be sharing a recording of today's webinar and there'll be an opportunity at the end to ask questions via the chat box. When you are writing the chat box, just make sure that you're writing to all panellists and attendees so everyone can see your questions. Let me introduce our expert for today and also our keynote for our ECS Virtual Leadership Conference, Kim Cofino. <laughs> Kim has been an educator in international schools since August 2000, having lived and worked in Germany, Malaysia, Thailand and Japan. Kim has a variety of roles in international schools, including her favourite as an instructional coach. Now based in Bangkok, Thailand, Kim is the co-founder and CEO of Aduro Learning and author of Your Connected Classroom, a practical guide for teachers. Please join me in welcoming and handing over to Kim. Thank you, Kim. Thank you so much. Thank you for the warm welcome. Hi, everybody. I am super excited to be here and chatting with you today about unique challenges that women face pursuing a leadership role. Thank you so much for that warm intro. I will make sure that I have a couple of points to stop and pause and take time for questions. Uh, but of course, feel free to jump in anytime and Joe will help me facilitate answering questions as we go through. This whole workshop is inspired by a project I did last year around this time, the spring of 2020, called Women Who Lead, where I interviewed over 70 successful women leaders around the world in various roles in international schools and public schools. As we go through the workshop today, I will have lots of opportunities for you to stop and reflect. And if you haven't had a chance to grab the workshop worksheets, the website address is on the screen right now. And I'll make sure that also gets sent around with the recording so that if you don't have time to grab them today, right in this moment, you can get them later. But in there, there'll be some of the key highlights from today's session, as well as some space for you to stop and reflect and jot down your thinking based on what we talk about today. So those worksheets will be available for you forever. As we go through today's session, I have broken it down into three parts. The first part is some facts and figures, some research that I did on women in leadership roles. The second part is sharing some highlights from the stories and experiences of the women who lead that I interviewed last spring. And then the third is about some solutions and strategies that they shared in those conversations with me. As we go into these facts and figures, it's quite possible that some of this data is not new to you. So I'd love for you to share some other data in the chat box as we kind of go through. If there's some stats that you're familiar with too, I just kind of wanted to set the stage for what we're going to be talking about today. I think probably the biggest shout from these interviews that I got was that when I spoke to Deb Welsh, the CEO of Academy of International School Heads, she talked about that the number of women in head of school positions for the last 10 years during her tenure and Bambi Betts tenure has not shifted from 28 to 33 percent. It's been in that range over the last 10 years. So our perception that there are more women in higher leadership roles may be less accurate than we think. She referenced the um, diversity collaborative survey when she talked about that the pipeline is a trickle by the time you get to the top. So we may be seeing more women in leadership roles at the lower level of educational leadership, but not so much at the top. What was a great outcome from the research I did, and you may have also seen this diversity collaborative survey, is that schools are committed to embracing diversity within their students and they're just not quite there yet in terms of looking at that for their leadership positions. So we need to be more aware of how we're demonstrating attributes of diversity among our leadership team the same way we're focusing on that with our students. Some stats for you. As of 20, 2009, only 13% of higher education institutions in 27 EU countries were headed by women. I'm going to run through these quickly. Less than 1% of head teachers in the UK are Black and ethnic minority females. 
in Australian secondary schools, close to 60% of teachers are females, but they make up just over 40% of the principals. In Japan, only 6% of lower secondary school principals are female. In the US, 65.8% of teachers are female, while only 48.5% of those principals are female. In the US, white male teachers and administrators receive more mentoring than either female colleagues or those of color and are more frequently favored for leadership positions over individuals from minoritized groups. Even down to the state level, in Texas, black and female assistant principals are systemically delayed and denied promotions compared to their white or male counterparts. This is not a problem in just one place. It's a global issue. In your worksheets, that I shared with you earlier today, I summarize some of this data in the chart that looks like this. This is an issue all over the world. There really isn't any place that's doing it really well. And that's kind of part of what inspired this Women Who Lead interview series. That is now a course that we offer on my website at adurolearning.com where you can learn from all of these women who lead. In the interviews that I conducted, I spoke to 23 heads of school 20 principals, 20 curriculum directors, and 12 influential leaders. And those interviews are still ongoing. So I actually interviewed Joellen Killian earlier today, which was amazing. So I have more interviews becoming part of this program as I speak to more women who lead. In the current series, I have 34 women of color, eight non-native English speakers, three LGBTQI plus educators, and educators are working on all continents except Antarctica, except they're not all from there, but they're working all over the world. So it's very representative of women in leadership positions around the world. And that was really intentional in the design of the work. I wish I could share 70 stories with you today, but I'm not gonna be able to fit all of them into one short workshop. So I've highlighted some quotes and statements from 17 women today. Uh, joining the Women Who Lead program will give you access to all of those interviews and all future interviews that I conduct, but you'll just get a little bit of a taste in today's session. Before I go on to the second part, are there any questions, points that anyone wants to stop and bring up at this point in time? Nope, I think no questions so far, Kim, but I'll let you know. Okay. Okay, I'll keep going. So in this second part, I would like to share some of the stories that came out in these interviews. And I'm going to focus specifically on obstacles, the challenges that women face in pursuing a leadership role. We talked about way more than challenges in these conversations, but this is kind of the part where there was a lot to really dig into. So please don't misinterpret the whole program as being focused on negatives. It's just this part is really interesting and I think worth digging deeper into. I've kind of summarized them all into six categories. And these were themes that came out in the conversations. And I'm gonna share quotes in each of these sections and tell you some stories that the women shared under these broad categories of expectations, microaggressions, lack of opportunity, exclusive networking practices, double standards, and lack of mentorship. One of the really interesting things that came out from these conversations was, of course, I know the expectation of a leader, like the stereotype is a white man. And I know that a female head of school is maybe more unexpected than having a traditional white man in that role. But what I didn't expect was to hear about such detailed expectations for people in leadership roles and in specific I was really intrigued by both Elsa Donahue, who's currently head of school at Vientiane International School in Laos, and Marta Medved, who is currently head of school at Western Academy of Beijing in China, their comments about linguistic expectations. Elsa talked about the fact that she is a non-Anglo English speaker, that that got in the way in several of her head of school interview experiences because her accent wasn't the accent you're hearing from me right now. And Marta talked about when she became head of school, being in professional development, in professional communities, being the one who is the only second language English speaker. That's an area of inequity 
that kind of perspective hadn't occurred to me before I had these conversations. So thinking about the way that we define our leaders all the way down to that very granular, granular level. Another theme that emerged is the presence of microaggressions in everyday experiences for these leaders. And Junla Madalinsky, currently the elementary and middle school principal at Shutz American School in Alexandria, Egypt, at the time she was in Nanjing, um, talked about the fact that being more visible in a leadership role made these microaggressions much more prevalent in her daily life. Because when she was a classroom teacher, she could be behind closed doors and you know, doing her work. But as soon as you become more visible in your leadership role, there's an opportunity for people to have little critiques about you every day. And they kind of play themselves out on a much more daily basis than she was experiencing prior to this. And Katie Welbrook talked, uh, sorry, assistant principal for academics at Suzhou Singapore International School in China, talked about things like being critiqued for the clothing that she was wearing in an interview and wondering, are these the same kind of questions you would ask of a man? So having to go through that thought process of how you respond to these kind of questions and statements on a daily basis, whether it's in your everyday part of your job or whether it's in the interview process, those being so much more visible once you're in a leadership role. Many of the women talked about lack of opportunity for leadership positions. And I'm highlighting here Nadine Richards, who was the high school principal at the American School of Dubai in the UAE at the time, and Madeline Hyde, who is currently head of school at Lincoln American School in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Nadine talked about the fact that when you are in schools, we all know we see so many women in classrooms, but at the very highest levels of leadership, it's still a very slim minority. And she referenced the fact that it's very obvious that the glass ceiling still exists and it's not something that's going to change overnight. Madeline told me the story of interviewing for 15 different positions and being rejected one after another. And she could tell in those interview experiences what that they were wondering as they looked at her, can you lead? And I love her response to that was, here I am. And I think that feeling of having to overcome so much rejection time after time because you don't fit the part, you don't look right, is something that women and particularly women of color are facing in their pursuit of leadership positions. I don't think this is going to be a surprise to anyone in the session right now, but another challenge that came up was exclusive networking practices. And this is gonna come up a couple of times in this presentation. I had trouble putting it just into one slide because it came up again and again. And I'd like to share two stories now, one from Susanna Gemsby, the head of school at Washington International School in the US, and then also uh, Junla Madalinsky again, the elementary and middle school principal at Schutz American School in Alexandria, Egypt. And Susanna told this great story, which you will hear when you join the Women Who Lead program. She talked about going to her very first meeting as a head of school and walking into the room and the room being full of tall white men kind of slapping each other on the back, calling each other coach because lots of heads of school, particularly in the US, particularly in the South, come up through athletics. And when they saw her there, they assumed she was there to take notes. And just that kind of assumption and having to handle that again and again and again in your career, no, I'm here to be part of the meeting, I'm not the secretary. Um, and Junla talked about the fact that, especially in international schools, our hiring practices are overly reliant on who you know. It's about having a network and being connected to others. But if you are a newer educator or you are a woman of color or you don't have that network, it's so much harder to get your foot in the door. That need for social currency comes a lot easier to white men who've been in the system for much longer than younger, ambitious women leaders who may not fit that kind of stereotype that we perceive as leaders. I will admit one of my questions had a little bit of a leading statement where I asked specifically about double standards, but so many of the stories I heard were rich with kind of personal 
narratives and I'm sharing two here with you today. One from Jennifer Tickle, who is secondary principal at Dresden International School and the other from Katrina Moran, head of school at Saigon South International School in Vietnam. And there's a lot more to both of these stories in the Women Who Lead program, but the little tidbits I pulled out today were that Jennifer and her husband are both in admin positions. And when they go recruiting for her husband to get an admin position, no one um, really ever looks at her CV. In fact, she told the story about being asked about what she's good at. And she jokingly said, I bake great cupcakes. And that was written down in the interview. When they go to interview for her position, no one ever asks her husband what he can do to support her in an admin position. So that kind of double standard for men and women. And Katrina talked about early in her career, she was told many times that you're the best person to do this, but you're too nice. And she started to develop or wonder if people were thinking that maybe a woman might not be able to step up and communicate hard decisions. So this expectation that women can't handle the challenges of being a leader. One of the questions I asked about was about mentorship and the value of mentorship in a woman's career, especially for leadership. And this is kind of connecting back to the networking piece that I was talking about earlier. Nicole Schmid, currently high school principal at the American International School of Johannesburg, South Africa, talked about this moment she had where she walked into the cocktail lounge at a leadership recruiting fair and saw that the room was full of older white men and that idea that this space is an old boys club. And I really appreciate her phrasing when she talks about there's a bubble around access and engagement and conversations that happen in those social circles that are not particularly welcoming unless you're in that clique. If you don't know how to play that game, it's hard to break in. This idea that all of these people in these positions already know each other and they're kind of passing positions from one to another. How can you move up without a mentor to guide you and help you and support you into breaking into that circle? Tambi Tyler, the head of school at the Colorado Springs School in the US, really talked about the lack of visible mentors and visible role models in her career. And the way she describes it is absolutely perfect. She says, if you don't see anyone that looks like you doing it, it's a very far reach to see yourself doing it. And she'll come back again where she talks about the importance of being better mentors as women to all women that are coming up behind us. Those six themes kind of emerged as specific challenges and obstacles to women pursuing a leadership career. That is just highlights ones that kind of stood out, jumped out to me that when I was making this presentation, I thought, oh, that was an interesting story or that's an interesting story. There is so much more in the whole Women Who Lead program. I can't tell you 70 stories in 45 minutes, but it's really interesting the common threads that came out throughout all of those interviews and conversations. So I'm gonna take another opportunity to pause here and see if there's any questions or anything anybody wants to bring up at this moment. Just a couple of people are saying how, how it resonates with them and sounds very familiar. Um, oh, good. I'm glad. Um, Not that I'm glad that you're having those same challenges, but I'm glad that it's making sense for you. Yeah, that's it. That's everything at the moment. Okay. So I do want to point out that we didn't just talk about the negative side of things. We also talked about solutions and strategies that can help us move forward. And what I really like about this section of this presentation is these are all strategies and ideas that came from the women who lead based on their own experience. And I think everything that's going to be shared in this section is, are things that we can all do, things that we can implement in our schools. And that's really exciting. Again, I'm gonna break it down into six chunks because that helps me think. Um, I'm going to talk about systems and structures, uh, women supporting women, owning and using your own voice, the power of mentorship, involving men in the conversation and how we can notice leadership qualities in others. Again, I'm just gonna highlight a few voices and a few stories as I go through. There's a lot more in the whole program, but these kind of jumped out to me in this part of the presentation. Carolyn Brookvam, director of the American School of Montana Rivo, I can never say that right, Madagascar, talked about the importance of having built-in systems to check your biases. Knowing that we have biases isn't enough to 
not have them, right? So she talked about putting processes and practices and procedures in place to make sure you can't act on your own bias as an organization, because that's what's going to make the difference. She talked about changing the procedures that we use at schools and the example she gave was using blind CVs when hiring. And that's just a very small but practical thing that any school can immediately implement to ensure that you're evaluating candidates based on their suitability for the position rather than what they look like. I also appreciate that in that diversity collaborative survey, they talked about the factors that really influence successful inclusion is intentionality and comprehensive long-term strategic commitment. So I think that goes together because if we build in these systems to check bias and we build them in a way that is comprehensive and long-term, that's a sustainable change that schools can build over time to ensure that their school staff represents the diversity they are equally interested in seeing in their student body. Another interesting, and this is kind of a challenge, and I didn't include it in the challenge because I thought I would talk about it here, is the fact that there is a little bit of a perception that there's only a certain amount of positions for women. That if there's a position available and it's a position that's suitable for a woman, we have to fight each other for that position. And one of the solutions that was discussed in many different ways in these conversations is as women supporting other women, that there's room for all of us. And when we're lifting each other up, all boats are rising, right? So like supporting women in their next step in their career and being supportive of women who are trying out for leadership positions around you. I really appreciated the way Abir Shinawi, who is a consultant and a head of department in Baltimore, US, phrased it, she said, we need to fix each other's crowns instead of tearing each other down. And Nina Shomendanji, who's the Assistant Dean of Learning of Enrichment and Readiness at Moraine Valley Community College in Chicago, talked about the importance of supporting other women, even if you never got that support. And she tells quite a few really rich stories about not having the support of other women in her career, but how she's gone out of her way to support other women. And I think as women in our school communities, we can do that. We can look out for each other. We can build that community of caring even in my conversation with Joellen Killian this morning, she talked about having that circle of women to support her as she went through her career. Instead of fighting for a single position, can we shift our mindsets to supporting each other? Fiona Reynolds, the deputy head of school at the American School of Bombay in India and many others talked about the importance of owning your voice and that in leadership positions and leadership training even, we're often taught to mimic the traditional stereotype of a traditional leader, a white man, and that kind of style of communication that's very direct. And I really appreciated Fiona sharing this story about the fact that many cultures are more indirect than direct. And by following that kind of traditional leadership style, we're actually getting in the way of ourselves. So shifting the mindset and shifting the narrative about what makes a good communicator and what makes a good leader to embrace your storytelling style or your unique style rather than sacrificing yourself to become like someone you're not. Again, like I think that comes into a mindset shift and recognizing that others can be adaptable and adapt to you and your style of leadership can work even if it's not what is traditionally expected. I said before I'd come back to mentorship, this was a whole theme throughout the entire uh, conversation. And I really appreciate the way Tambi Tyler, head of school at the Colorado Springs School in USA, talked about the fact that all women should be reaching back for other women across the depth and breadth, breadth of the organization. We need to be better mentors. And many, many, many of the women talked about that they are going out of their way to support other women in their leadership journeys because of the lack of women that they had supporting them. Many times more so because there weren't women in those positions to support them, um, but also that we can continue to do better to support others. I also really appreciate 
appreciated Abir's comment, Abir Shanawi, um, consultant out of Baltimore, USA, talking about how leadership can be so isolating. And in her position, and maybe in many of your positions, you might be the only woman seeking a leadership position in your institution. You might be the only woman of color, and that experience can be super isolating. So finding a mentor or a group of women to surround yourself with and channel their energy and learn from each other, that's a way to help you overcome that feeling of isolation that comes from being potentially the only person trying to do what you're trying to do in your organization. Several women brought up the importance of involving men in this conversation, and I'm pulling uh, Clarissa Saison, elementary principal at International School of Beijing China's statement here because she really summed it up really well. She talked about the fact that men are in the position to mentor or sponsor women, to elevate and support and guide them. And if they're not aware of the challenges that women have in pursuing a leadership role, they might not look with intentionality at the women in their organizations to support them in the ways that they need to be supported. So how can we have this conversation with the men in our organizations so they understand the level and type of support that women need to empower them to pursue their leadership journey? I also really appreciated lots of people talked about the power of being tapped on the shoulder. Like many of the women talked about that they would not have chosen this particular leadership path had someone not you know, tapped them on the shoulder and, and pointed out that they have leadership qualities. And Lynn Sawyer, who's a consultant out of Nevada in the US also talked about this and she said it really nicely. So I've included her on this slide here, even though she's not the only one who mentioned it. She talked about the importance of calling out qualities that they see in other people that they may not be aware of themselves noticing these attributes for leadership and identifying them and sharing them with that person can be a turning point. And that same strategy is recognized in the diversity collaborative survey where they talk about encouragement and paying it forward and even informal conversations, having a really productive push on cultivating diverse learners. And this is something so simple, something we all can do in a leadership position or not, if you see someone that has potential to tell them because they might not see it themselves. And many, many, many of the women that I spoke to said that that was a turning point in their career. So it's very obvious that that's something that makes a big difference. A really uh, positive statement that came out of the diversity collaborative survey is that school leaders have enormous power in schools and those who prioritize diversity, equity and inclusion made a difference, regardless of the context of the school, the host country culture, the environment that they were in, if they were able to prioritize DEI work, they were able to make a difference. And so I think all of those strategies that I just shared are potential ways to ensure that you and your school leaders can do this work in your schools as well. All right, I've got another stop and pause, questions, thoughts, concerns. I think people are saying how, how important mentoring is um, and informal mentoring as well. Um, so people are definitely finding that that's a useful tool that they've had. Yeah, if you do have any any questions or um, or comments, please write them in the chat box um, and I can share them with Kim as we go along. Thanks, Kim. Yeah. So really, that's all I was going to share with you today. I talked so fast. I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was going to talk so fast. I do want to let you know that the um, Women Who Lead program, we're running a special summer cohort for ECIS. And that registration is actually open right now for you if you would like to join. And there is a special bonus for you. There is a course that we don't include in Women Who Lead called The Key Elements of a Leadership CV. And that was created by Kathleen Nagley, head of school at International School Helsinki. And you can actually get that course for free if you join the ECIS summer cohort and you register by the 27th of February, 2021. And there's a coupon code on the screen right there now for you to get both of those things together. The cohort will run over the summer. I talked to a few leaders and they talked about not having time to do professional learning during the academic year. So during the summer is a really great time for them. And what I think is really powerful about this opportunity of having a real-time cohort is we can have 
conversations like this that would be more like a conversation because it wouldn't be a webinar presentation, it would be a conversation um, during those summer months. So the cohort will run the 14th of June through the 16th of August this summer. The link is on the screen and I think I put it next, that all that information is in the webinar worksheets as well. So if you download those worksheets, you'll get all that information in there. If you ever have any questions about any of this, or you want to take a preview and see what's happening in this cohort, head over to our website at adurolearning.com slash women, and you can see all the journey to leadership stories. So you can hear from the 70 women how they got into their positions of leadership, how they worked, and what their personal journey was. And that will give you kind of a taste of the program. And there's also a four-part email series that you can subscribe to and get more information as well. I think that's all I was going to say today. So I have plenty of time for any questions or comments or anything anyone wanted to chat about. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see them. It's amazing, Kim. Um, thank you so much. And I know that we do have um, a mentoring program, which is being launched hopefully in a couple of months um, at ECIS. Um, so hopefully that platform will allow or allow women leaders to network and mentor that you mentioned was so important. Um, Kim is also going to be our keynote at our leadership conference and I think you shared with me Kim that you're going to share some sneak peeks of some of these videos within your keynote um, so I will yes. share that link with with everyone after the webinar um, so you can you can see information about that we do have a women who lead track um, at our leadership conference as well with many fantastic workshops uh, with quite a few of you actually who I can see attending leading those workshops so it's so great to have you with us um, today too. Um, just a few comments, Kim, from, from the attendees that they're so grateful, grateful for what you're doing. Um, it's such rich information and your tremendous service to women in international schools, um, men too. Um, and that you do speak very fast, but your English is very clear and very oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so I, I will make sure that everyone gets um everyone gets the the power the um, PowerPoint and also um, the the web sheets um, as well. We have a couple of questions. Um, I'm also wondering if you include socioeconomics in one of as one of your param parameters. You, I'm assuming that you mean like who I interviewed. And I'm going to say no, I didn't intentionally do that, but it was really interesting to see what actually came out of the people who I interviewed. I had quite a few really interesting conversations through connections from international schools with people that I never would have been connected to. So for example, there's one um, woman that I interviewed who is the head of school in Dubai of what would be called an international school, but was more like a local school. She is Lebanese born, living in Dubai, head of school at an international English speaking school and listening to her career path compared to some of the other career paths of the maybe more traditional international school teachers or leaders was really interesting. So that is an area where I could continue to focus more on and bring more into these conversations because I think that that's not something that occurred to me at the start and I really appreciate the point there. Um, and I see that in the same question you're asking about a single parent, being a single parent, that came up a lot. I don't think I addressed any aspect of that part of what we talked about because that was a whole separate question. We talked about finding a sense of mental well being, and I used the word balance in my interview question, but that was really controversial because obviously balance has a lot of different connotations. But it came up a lot about parenting, being a single parent, um, the challenges of being a leader being a parent, being perceived as not being able to do your job because you have children, um, having that, I would even say control over whether or not you're successful in an interview because of your family status, being a big part of obstacles that women face in their leadership pathway. Uh, we've, we've had another one. Um, have you considered interviewing men on this topic? Oh, okay, so that's a great question because I would really like to find a way to both include men in the conversation and help them feel informed without sacrificing the importance of like a safe space for women. 
quite a few of the conversations, I didn't specifically ask this question, but I always asked a question at the end. Now we've had this conversation, is there anything that I should have asked you? And quite a few times it came up, I'm gonna rephrase one particular example. Um, and she talked about, even though I have an extremely supportive leadership team, an extremely supportive head of school that I feel very comfortable with, I don't feel comfortable expressing these kinds of concerns to him because he doesn't understand where I'm coming from yet. And so that idea that, that there needs to be more conversations with men to help them understand the realities, I think is really important. I don't know if it's a matter of directly interviewing them with these same questions, but it's definitely on my mind, like how can we build in that space to help them better understand the challenges that women are going through. So it doesn't put the actual women that are working for them on the spot of having to explain why this is a microaggression and how this is happening every single day, because then that has cascading effects beyond as well. Right, and we've got another question um, around, I'm looking forward to, move forward to moving into a leadership role, but I am very aware that admin is not something I'm interested in pursuing. What other types of leadership roles are available for those who want to work in leadership, but not in admin in particular? I'm struggling to see some other types of leadership roles. Do you have any any suggestions with that one? That's such a good question. I think it, we, we're in a tough situation in schools that there aren't a lot of varieties of leadership responsibilities. And the ones that you list are ones that I would immediately think of, like curriculum director, something to do with technology coaching or instructional coaching, being coordinator, PYP, MYP, DP, all of those positions are leadership positions, head of department, and that may seem more like admin to you and you know, less interesting than some of those others. And in fact, I had another interesting conversation, not as part of this interview series, but with someone who is in the series talking about the kind of stereotype that those are positions for women because they're not admin positions. And that's a whole, additional interesting avenue to pursue. I think probably the most like non-admin position that was a straight straighter path to leadership was that curriculum director role. But in many schools that is a senior leadership position already. I think coaching is a great position. I've been a coach for a really long time. You have a lot of leadership. I'm just going to go out on the coaching lens for a minute. You have a lot of autonomy and a lot of opportunity and a lot of influence as a coach. And it's not positional leadership, but it's a really interesting opportunity to develop your leadership skills in a position that actually in some ways can be really hard because you don't have that positional leadership. And if you're interested in that, I have a lot of stuff on coaching too. <laughs> That's my other like huge passion. So please reach out. I'm happy to talk to you about coaching as well. Yeah, she's actually said that her main interest is coaching, but she doesn't find that many positions have that coach, that coach position within their schools. Yes. Okay. Get in touch with me. I'd love to talk to you about that more. <laughs> Great. And I, I will share your, your email with everyone, um, Kim, in the follow up. Yep, perfect. Um, so if there are any questions um, that you want to reach out to Kim on, please do. As I'm, I know you're welcome. You're welcome some more contacts and networks as well, Kim. Yes. Amazing. Oh, thank you, Shay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm seeing the comments come in and Shay is mentioning my exact coaching opportunity. Thank you. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Kim. Um, it was so great to have you join us today. Um, and we're all very excited to hear you um, at our leadership conference, share more information Yay. on this. Um, but, but thank you so much once again. Thank you all for joining, joining us this morning, this afternoon, wherever you're from. Um, and I hope you all stay safe and have, have a great rest of the day. Thanks, Kim. Love to Bye. see you soon.